Good morning. So I'm going to get started because I talk a lot. Um, first, I want to start off a uh, full disclaimer. Make sure you get my good side. I didn't know there's media in here. So, um, you know, make sure that you're not getting this side, just this side only. Uh, I appreciate that. And as I walked into this room, this is a little bit different than last year. I noticed some, you know, young faces. Yeah, I, I, except I was. <laughs> you're stealing my joke. I, I mean, you know, I was just going to point you out. Um, clearly, there are some young faces and some very young faces and it's really impressive um, just to see the diverse population in here as I talk more about you know the work that I do and the presentation um, on how to support unhoused youth I hope that it, it becomes more of a conversation and not just me like standing here lecturing so with that being said I'm gonna get started feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions my name is Serena Wynn, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. What that is, is uh, I, a therapist, that, that's for short. Um, I know a lot of people, when they hear social work, they think that I'm there to take the kids away. And so I always start off introducing myself, the work that I do, because it's a little bit different. Um, right now I'm working as a school social worker in Simi Valley. Uh, I, I've been here for three years. I was the first to be hired. The school district noticed that there, there was a need and with the funding, they were able to hire on my position. Prior to that, I worked in um, the LA County doing very similar thing, going to different school sites as a, a psychiatrist psychiatric social worker and I work with many different population our unhoused youth is just among one of the vulnerable populations that I I feel very blessed and grateful to work with because they tend not to open up so when they do and it takes a very long time to feel safe as you will experience that as well um, so don't be shocked because it happens to me too as somebody who's uh, been doing this work for for quite a while it takes them at least 90 days to really trust that person to open up and be vulnerable with you so don't be surprised don't feel like I'm not doing a good job because this kid is not talking to me just know that it's going to take time the more consistent you are the more that you show up the more that you be there and and just support them without any judgment just know that it's going to work I'm going to jump into the presentation I promise but I do like to connect with the audience I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about why this work is important to me um, I when I was very young I lived with 14 other people they were my family members in a two bedroom one and a half bathroom condo so I slept in the kitchen with my parents um, so when we're talking about unhoused youth, what we're gonna talk about the definition of what that is. I think that in our mind, we think about unhoused youth just mean that people are living on the street. But there are so many different definition of what unhoused mean. It just means unstable living uh, and bad condition. Although my situation was not horrible condition, but sharing a, a very small space with other people, especially as a young person growing into her teenage years, was very difficult. And it was volunteers like yourself um, that really made a difference. Um, I, I had a lot of trouble growing up, also like adjusting to the new country. I'm looking at Sheila over there, and I'm gonna give you that highlight. I, I was really shocked when I saw her here, um, and I, I was I got really nervous because, um, you know, she was one of the the what it was it called adult leaders at, at at the church that I went to. Um, the I promise you, you as a volunteer, your work is so important. Um, you know, organizations, nothing can work without your soul, your, your heart, and, and the investment that you put in um, to, to these young kids. So um, with that being said, we're going to get started. So here's a little agenda. Oh, so sorry. Uh, the definition that we use in the school, again, we call our, our kiddos McKinney Vento. I'm not going to dive into that because it's not really relevant to you. But just know that we identify students that are experiencing homelessness as kids that are living in shelters, transitional housing, motels, hotels, staying with others. So there are some kids that are living in um, like a garage, for example or on the couch, sur couch surfing, or they're um, sharing the, the, ex the, the space with many different people due to economic hardship. 
And the last definition is unsheltered. This is more of your, like, normal definition of unhoused, right? Are the kids or people that are living on the street, uh, in the cars, at the parks, or just public place spaces. For me, what I've noticed is that it doesn't matter where they live. Yes, like, it's nice to live in motels. Um, it's nice to have some shelter. It's nice to stay with, you know, uh, staying with other people. Um, all of the, these three examples might be a little bit easier than those that are living in unsheltered places, but how it affects them is still very similar. Uh, these are some of the top challenges of homeless children face in attending school. Um, we're not going to dive into this, but just know that there are many different reasons as to why they don't attend school, and then which leads to the cycle of poverty, right? Because if you know, if we don't get an education, we cannot get a decent job, we cannot get ourselves out of the constant cycle of having no place to go, working really hard, um, and and living. And, and poverty. So again, the work that you guys do is really important because you're giving them these skills that their parents might not, were not as blessed to to be able to to learn at a young age. So this work is really important because it's going to push them and help them and guide them into a better future. Uh, this is some things, some of the things that uh, as a school districts we do to remove the barriers from our McKinney Vento students so that they can obtain their, their education and hopefully um, get into higher education and <clears throat> eventually move out of, the, of poverty. Uh, mental health stressors, a lot of our kiddos that are unhoused do face, um, are at a higher risk for sexual and dating violence, substance use, and suicide. I'm going to spend some time talking about trauma-informed care. I know I talked a lot about this last time, um, talking about the ACEs, so I'll try to not repeat myself from last year, um, but also give the information that is still relevant for, for our new folks. Having a trusted relationship with at least one adult during childhood is associated with lower risk of mental illness. I just wanted to just, like, I'm going to read it one more time. Having a trusted relationship with at least one, just one adult during childhood is associated with lower risk of mental illness. I had a really rough life growing up. And it took one person to just look at me and say, I believe in you. I trust you. You can do it. What do you need? How can I help? And that made a difference. These are the four R's of trauma-informed care. Realize, recognize, respond, and resist. So we want to realize this is, what, this is why we're doing this presentation. This is why we're talking about it. So that we realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand potential paths for recovery. Trauma changes your brain structure. It actually, like there's a book, it's called um, The Body Keeps a Score, if you're interested in, yeah, I see some head nods, so you're familiar with it. Um, being exposed to trauma changes the way that your brain shapes, like the physical structure of it. It also changes a lot of the way that neural pathways are being connected. It Then what it does is it, it affects the way that you connect with other people. It affects the way that you think. It affects the way that you behave. And so by recognizing the signs and symptoms and uh, the uh, of symptoms of trauma in our clients, family, staff, and others involved with the system, then we can respond appropriately. We respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma, procedures, and practices. And I'll give you some of that examples because I don't want to say that I 100% of the kids that are walking into your events and, and you're getting your services have experienced trauma, but I can say 99.999 of the kids that are walking through the door have been exposed to at least one traumatic event. We resist re-traumatizing children as well as adults who care for them. So talking about how do we take care as the person that are providing the support for these kids, for these families that are really struggling. 
Um, you all will have access to the slides. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I, I do want to give us some time for an activity towards the end. But last year I talked about the, the ACEs, um, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. But there was a study that was done by CDC and Kaiser, I forgot what year, but it involved um, at least 17,000 participants. And what they found was that anybody that has at least one adverse childhood experiences, there were like, they used 10, it talked about substance, substance abuse in the home, any type of abuse in the home, um, and like, you know, has your parent ever been incarcerated um, to, what else was it? Oh, mental illness, uh, did I say substance use yet? There were 10 of them, I can't remember all of them. But if you have at least one, one of them, your risk of disrupted neur neurodevelopment, social, emotional, cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and it could also lead to early death. Again, it goes back to trauma, affects the brain, brain affects your thoughts, your body, along with your behaviors which could lead to all of the above. Just some more information um, on childhood trauma, long-term and common causes. So what do I do? Trauma-informed support for children. One, we always try to create safety. And I, I, I talk about this for the classroom as well. Um, create safety. What does that mean? How do, so when you're thinking about the events, you're planning the events. How do we create safety for these kids? Because these kids might be coming from places that are unsafe. How can I make you feel safe when you're here? These kids might feel maybe you are safe right now, right? Even though they're here with you, they still feel unsafe. What can I do to help you? Uh, regulate the nervous system. So, our amygdala, that's a part of the brain that's responsible for freeze, fight, fight flight, or freeze, it's, it's a really helpful thing. It's a, a part of the brain that kind of keeps you safe, right? If you are going on a hike and you see a bear, you're not gonna be like, oh, what should I do? Do I hug this bear? Do I run away from this bear? Should I have a picnic? Like, no, you're, you're, you're maybe, right? Your amygdala is there to protect you. Oh. I'm in danger, so now I'm gonna either, some people, I'm sure you can pop it up on YouTube, some of these people are trying to fight a bear, some people are like, run away, some people freeze. What's your, I'm not gonna, you don't have to tell me, but I, you know, you wanna think about like, what is my, my, my response? So some of these kids, is, kids, some of these kids are doing the same thing. Um, whether they're here, whether they're in a, uh, experience a real traumatic event or they're in spaces, but then they get triggered because something, oh, I smell something, I see something, I hear something, I touch something, I taste something that reminds myself, put myself in a moment that was really terrifying, I'm gonna act out. The amygdala, so ner calming down the nervous system by certain activities that we, can t we will talk about, helping them through the five senses, Regulate, let's calm you down, you are safe. Let's bring you back to the moment. You're safe. You're not there, you're here. Build a connected relationship. Um, it's just, I, I guess, as simple as that, build, building a connection with somebody can, can already, it, again, it, it's gonna take time, but once they identify you as a safe adult, they can just look at you and know that you will not hurt me. Support development of coherent narrative, so having a conversation with them about it, offering like structure, routines, letting them know ahead, this is the agenda for the day. This is what it's going to look like. In their life, a lot of these kids don't get that. They don't have a structure routine. They don't know what's going to happen. That's why anxiety comes out, right? Kids, of course, we don't want to be like so rigid with our routine and structure, but at the same time, having some can really help alleviate some of the anxiety. Build social, emotional, and resilient skills. Um, so what can we teach these kids when they're experiencing strong emotions, when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling anxious? Here are some skills. They can take away, they can practice, you practice with them, you model it for them, and that's how they build these skills. Foster post-traumatic growth. 
Are there certain qualities and skills that can help people be resilient and overcome, you know, and, and survive, su survive devastating trauma? And they can find eventually, we're not saying like right now, but eventually they can find purpose and meanings in, in their own past by creating, you know, like for me, I, it took a while, but I can find um, the meaning and, and purpose as to why I went through what I went through. Building trust. Think about the person that you trust the most in your life. The person that if you have any tea, you're gonna go to that person. If you need any help, you're going to that person. And you know if you have tea at work or at home, you're not going to the person that's about to blast it on social media. You're not going to the person that's like, oh my gosh, that happened? What's wrong with you? Like, you're not going to that person, right? You're going to the person that's like, ooh, that was a lot. You wanna talk about it? How can I help you? I'm here with you. There's no judgment. Let's talk about it, right? You wanna show empathy, respect. You're not judging them like, oh, poor kid. Like, no, they don't want pity. They want you to put yourself in their shoes. So you're hearing their stories and you're walking through their experience with them. Um, create a safe, envir a welcoming environment, consistent and predictable behavior. Listen actively uh, and be mindful of your facial expressions. You might not verbally say like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? But it's like. <laughs> <laughs> I do this. I mean, I, in family therapy, I do this because I'm like, mom, dad. You're not saying it, but I can see on your face. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, oh, right, right. So practice in the mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror. When you talk, when, when someone's talking to you, what is your face doing? What's your hand doing? Like, oh my God. Right? I, I don't, your body's going to respond. It's natural. Be mindful of that. Understand and address their needs. I might not know the, all the answers, but let's go to somebody that can. You're not, you don't have to walk this road alone anymore. Provide choices and autonomy. A lot of these kids are coming from places that they don't have choices. You have melons, different melons out there. You have what are honeydew and, and cantaloupe. What do you want? For them, it's just like, here, this is what you get. That's all you get. Give them options. You want a red crayon or green crayon? Don't just give it to them. Just for them, just, just even that little thing. I'm talking about my toddler because he'll have a tantrum if he doesn't get to choose. Certain things you can't choose. You can't choose what day the event is going to happen, but I'll give you options, you know, this activity or this activity. And that means a lot to them. It feels like I'm in control of the situation. And it's very powerful. Be transparent and honest. Not too honest, you know, like age appropriate, but be honest. Like, I'll be honest, this blueberry does not taste good, right? Building positive relationships with families. I always talk, in my work, I'm like, I cannot just do this one hour a week with this kid and, and send them back to the same home. I bring the families in because the fa they're going back to the same family all the time. I'm not gonna be there. I've had a parent that's like, oh my gosh, Serena, you can really calm him down. We thought about like, how can we take you home? No, no. How about let me teach you, mom, as a single mom, the skills so that you can be home and take it with you so you don't need me. I'm weird that I'm trying to work myself out of the job, but I really want you to make sure that you have the skills to, to keep going. Celebrate their strength and achievement. Uh, there, I have a slide talking about strength-based uh, work, so I'm, I'm going to hold off on that. And maintain confidentiality. Uh, it's a small town. It's a very small. It's, I grew up here in Simi Valley, so I know how small it is. So um, when you're, if you're going to have to break confidentiality, talking to somebody about the kid, just remind yourself um, that there's a reason for it. Maybe you're seeking for some help, but it's not like, oh, look what I did for this kid in a bragging way, but more like, 
maybe use a different name to protect that person's privacy. Um, and it just is always thing in the back of my mind, like, why am I talking about this kid? Why am I sharing their story? Communicating to the needs. So what I talked about earlier is the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, just expect that, you know, they're going to respond in some kind of way. And when the, I don't know if you guys got a lot of like the kids that are like aggressive, um, but if they do, you know, try to stay calm, go down to the level. I'm short, so I'm already there. Um, but if you're tall, bring yourself down, like, you know, get to their eye level, sit in a chair, let them, so that you're not like this, talking down to them. And that re really can make a difference. Uh, flight, just make, uh, again, th this is more for the, for the school setting, but if you have a safe place, if they're, they're feeling like really antsy, like, I don't know if you noticed, but I was nervous before presenting. And so what I did was I felt all of this adrenaline going inside of me. And I'm like, if I sit here, I, I probably will have running thoughts. But what I did is I, I walked around. I just keep walking until I burn off that cortisol, the stress level. And that's what's really important. If you're noticing a kid that's like, make sure he doesn't have to go pee pee. <laughs> <laughs> then you ask, do you want to go on a walk with me? Because I need to burn that off. Yeah. Uh, if they're freezing, like they're kind of shut down, withdrawn, or they're kind of completely out of it. Uh, one, make sure they're physically okay, like they had food and like there's no medical reasons. Uh, use some grounding techniques, kind of like breathing, you know, five, four, three, two, one, you know, five things you see, four things you hear, things like that. So to kind of get them back in the moment. So they're, they're, you know, daydreaming, kids daydream too, except they might be daydreaming not about like, oh, what am I gonna do this weekend in Solvang? What am I gonna do at the beach? Like they're probably daydreaming and, and think about things that are tough. And then if we're not able to stop them before it gets worse, um, it, it's gonna be a lot harder to de-escalate them. So again, just be mindful, scan the room. Um, button pushers, let me see. I'm doing really good. I have like eight minutes left. I just wanna <laughs> brag because I never get that happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good girl. Thank you. I'm gonna take a break. Uh, kiddos that have been through some any, some type of abuse, uh, physical, sexual, verbal, might be button pushers. These are the kids that are just um, keep bothering you and like test you. And um, I mean, often in the classroom, it might look like uh, I'm not doing this. No, I'm and like throwing a pencil at like their friend, trying to just just trying to push their teacher's button, right? Um, if, you, if you see that, just know that these kids, in their head, they already know adults or just people in general are not safe. I know that there's, some of you are not adults, but people are not safe. Adults are not safe. So what is gonna make you tick? Because at home, when I sneeze and that's too loud, my dad thinks I'm being annoying and then I'm, he's gonna yell at me, right? I know it's a silly example, but it really does happen. So what is it that's gonna push your button? What's your button? What can I do to piss you off? Because when you're gonna get pissed off, you're gonna hurt me. So I'm gonna keep doing this to make sure that you are a safe person or not. And so they keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you explode on them. It's that, that self-fulfilling prophecy is that, right. see, you're a mean person, just like everybody else. Prove themselves right. Prove themselves right. And so what you can do is some self-reflection. What are your buttons? What ticks you off? Is it a certain word? Is it a certain like thing that's touching you? I don't know. Just just think about what it is that ticks you off. Work on it and, and just be mindful of it that when they're doing that, it's not because, well, they're kind of doing it on purpose, but at the same time, there's a reason behind it. Regulate yourself throughout the day and, and um, so throughout events, make sure that you're like whew, giving yourself a break so that you recharge your energy, recharge your battery. Um, so you have more patience. I know I have to do that because I have two toddlers. Um, kiddos that have been neglected, often are the kids that's like, this event, I'm an adult. I know everything. What, what can you teach me? You're, I know everything. 
because this is the same kid that is feeding himself, learning how to microwave a hot pocket at three year old. So what can you do for me? I take care of myself, not just myself, I take care of my sister, my baby sister. I'm taking care, and I'm talking about like a four year old, right? I'm taking care of my mom or dad who are too drunk to take care of themselves or too high on drugs to take care of them, themselves. So what can you teach me? Some suggestions is, um, I know you guys have, like do give out food, so I think that's amazing. Just recognize and partner with this kid. Again, like, sh like acknowledging their strength. I see some leadership in you, you know? You, you kind of know a lot. Want to be my helper for the day? Um, give them like some task. Can you pass out this paper? Pass out some crayons? Give them some, some task to do to feel like, they, again, they're in control. Um, kids that have really poor attachment. So attachment is that relationship between them, them and caregivers. Um, and, and I try to say parent because not all kids live with their, their biological parents. So I say caregivers, the main person that's kind of consistent with them in their lives or not in their lives. Um, they lack that attunement and secure attachment. So they're going to try to get your attention. Miss, miss, you're trying to talk. Miss, miss, mister, mister. They're trying to get your attention because now you have to split your attention with five, six, or 10, or 20 other kids. And so it's like, no, 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 me, I'm here, I'm here. See me, hear me. So if you have some of those kiddos, maybe, again, ask them, like, like ask them to help you out. You know, like, hey, can you go write something on the board for me? Um, or if you have some time, and if you really know this kid, fill that bucket of me, maybe before the, uh, the meeting or an event uh, is going on. Um, pull them aside and just like, hey, how was your weekend? Or like, hey, um, did, how did you like the food? Hey, uh, I, I saw you were dancing to that song, like, good job, or whatever. You know, like, have conversation with them, check in with them, fill that bucket so they don't feel the need to um, go and, and get it throughout the, the event. Um, I don't know. Okay, so with medical trauma, these are the kids that might not, we might never know like what's triggering them or why they respond the way that they do. For example, our NICU babies, they don't have that verbal or they don't have much of a memory as, you know, like a, a toddler would or a, a young child would, but they have memories because the five senses, remember they feel and hear and see and taste everything. Um, what NICU can, like preemies can be very traumatizing and for a lot of these kids, constantly doctors touching them, the smell of the glove, there's certain like the, the heart monitor, beep, 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 beep. To us, it's not a big deal, but to them it's like, ugh, it's, I'm irritated, I don't know why. Uh, so even though you, we don't know what it is, we can still kind of help them regulate the emotion and like calm and ground them and be in the moment so that they can continue through the day. The strength-based approach, pointing out things that are positive about these kids that you're serving, because trust me, they're not thinking about it at all. I can tell you that in every single session that I have with kids or even adults, I'm like, all right, um, tell me things that you don't like about yourself. And it's like, da -da 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 -da. it's like word vomit. Awesome, now let's talk about things that, good qualities. Dead silent, what are those? What strength? Um, you know, things that you like, you, you feel confident about, or things that make you special, talents. I don't have any of those. They're not thinking about that. So bringing it out of them by even reflecting, hey, you know, I saw that you, um, you, you drew this, and, and that looked really awesome, or, I'm trying to think about like the activities that you guys do or like if they speak up or answer like I really like that you answer that um, you're really starting to you know show your voice I like it so just pointing out little things and I know it's going to take some time throughout the few events for you to recognize that and I would also um, suggest for you to figure that out too what are your top qualities? And um, I did link uh, like a little worksheet that you guys can go back and, and reflect on yourself too. Like what are some great qualities about you? But this is the last quote that I wanted to share with you all. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has ever has.
by Margaret Mead. So I'm going to leave you with that to think about during lunch. Um, it's really important work, the things that you're doing, um, this organization and the work that, again, just teaching these kids life skills and, and just everything and being that safe adult or that safe person. So have a good lunch and thank you for your time. Thank you.